Welcome and thank you for joining us for the 22nd annual New Jersey Department of Transportation Research Showcase. While we wish we could be together in person, we hope that you find our virtual program to be interesting and informative. This is a three-day virtual event consisting of many dynamic presentations in the field of research. We have incorporated most of the elements of the traditional program into the agenda. Please remember to use the chat pod for any questions. Without further delay, let's begin our program. I would like to introduce the New Jersey Department of Transportation Assistant Commissioner, Michael Russo. Mike is responsible for managing the Division of Statewide Planning, Multimodal Service, Local Aid, and Economic Development, and Environmental Resources. Prior to becoming Assistant Commissioner, Mike served as the Director of Local Aid and Economic Development, leading a team of professionals and administrative staff in five local aid offices responsible for the department's $530 million local aid program. I will now turn the program over to Mike. Thank, Thank you, you everybody and good morning and welcome to NJDOT's 22nd Annual Research Showcase. I hope everyone is managing to stay healthy and safe. You know, the world's a much different place since we met for our last research showcase. Just two short years ago, we viewed virtual public involvement and virtual meetings such as this as an innovation. And although we never envisioned the circumstances we face today, it seems only fitting that this year's showcase is being held virtually and taking advantage of this technology. So welcome to NJDOT's first virtual research showcase. This year's showcase being held over the next three days includes many of the features you have come to expect. As always, our virtual research showcase will provide an opportunity for New Jersey's transportation community to experience the broad scope of academic research being conducted by our institutions of higher education partners and their associates. It'll also highlight the benefits of DOT's own transportation research program. This year, we will not only highlight the benefits of research, but also the resultant innovations that will help the transportation community meet the challenges of tomorrow. The theme of this year's research showcase is preparing today for a resilient tomorrow. FHWA's definition of resiliency is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. And whether you subscribe to the theory of climate change or not, some of the facts are indisputable. We are experiencing more frequent severe weather events. New Jersey has had over 40 emergency declarations in the past 10 years. Our average annual temperatures have increased by three degrees over the past century. And sea levels along New Jersey's coast have risen by more than 16 inches in that same period of time. This is more than twice the global average. The effects of extreme weather have been identified as the third greatest risk to DOT's assets in our transportation asset management plan. And as we all know, a reliable transportation system in New Jersey is critical to the movement of people and goods along the Northeast Corridor and the backbone of New Jersey's economy. Over the next three days, we will be exploring how research and innovation are addressing these emerging challenges. Today's keynote speaker is Mr. Jerry Buckwalter, Chief Operating and Strategy Officer of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Mr. Buckwalter will be discussing a project known as the Future World Vision which will assess how change conditions will impact our built environment looking 50 years into the future. And how these change conditions brought about by climate change, alternative energy sources, high tech construction techniques and materials, connected and autonomous vehicles, along with smart cities will impact the profession of civil engineering. Tomorrow, we will hear from Mr. David Rosenblatt, the state's chief resilience officer, and NJDEP's Assistant Commissioner of Climate and Flood Resilience. And we will have a variety of sessions this week on resiliency-related initiatives, including work being done by Mr. John Carnegie of Rutgers on a flood risk visualization tool being developed in support of DOT's own resiliency efforts being led by Elkins Green and our Division of Environmental Resources. 
We will also provide opportunities for virtual po poster sessions. And later this morning, we will have one of my favorite items on the agenda, the 2020 Research Showcase Awards. I would like to acknowledge the folks that make this all happen. Today's program is organized by DOT's Bureau of Research in partnership with the New Jersey Local Technical Assistance Program at Rutgers University Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation. I would like to thank the Research Bureau's manager, Amanda Gendek, as well as Pragna Shah and the Bureau of Research staff, along with their LTAP partners under the leadership of Janet Lely at Rutgers Cape. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge our research partners and exp express my gratitude for the value that they bring to DOT's research program. Without the efforts of the university staff, our principal investigators, all the students and grant administrators, we wouldn't be here today to showcase our collective successes. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge a few people for their ongoing support. First, thank you, Commissioner Diane gutierrez Scacchetti. Deputy Commissioner Joe Bertoni, and Assistant, Andrew, Assistant Commissioner Andrew Tenard and Assistant Commissioner Chanel Patel for your attendance here today. And thank you to FHWA Assistant Division Administrator Valeria Remizova and your dedicated staff at the FHWA New Jersey Division Office for your continued sponsorship of this program. I would also like to thank FHWA's Helene Roberts for her contributions to the department's innovation efforts, including her active role in our stick council, as well as FHWA's division administrator, Robert Clark, for his unwavering support. And thanks to you, today's attendees and the presenters taking the time to participate. Research always has been the means to cultivate the innovations necessary to sustain New Jersey's transportation infrastructure today and in meeting newly emerging challenges moving forward into the future. I hope you all enjoyed today's sessions and without any further delay, it is great pleasure that I introduce our Commissioner of Transportation, Diane gutierrez Scacchetti. Good morning, Mike, uh, and good morning to all. It is always an, uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to have the uh, time with you today. As always, um, we start these meetings off by lamenting the fact that we wish we could be together, um, but right now, now that's not to be. Um, we need to continue to do our work um, and do it through all the technology research that predates any pandemic. Um, and not that we haven't had our, our issues like this morning um, in signing in. Um, we learn to be patient and we learn to work together and collaborate to make sure that all of these important opportunities and all these opportunities for collaboration continue to take place. The New Jersey Department of Transportation has been holding an annual research showcase since 1999. And so while we are gathered virtually, what I think is most rewarding is that we will continue to do what has become the focal point of the results of a pandemic. A new opportunity for extended research into perhaps areas we really never thought about before or not given the same rank as some of our our day to day transportation issues. So what does this event do? It again, as I say every year, brings together New Jersey's transportation community from planners and designers and engineers to academia and county and local transportation experts and the public and private sectors to get together and collaborate on what the future of our industry looks like. Each year we learn about the latest academic research, we share new technology and encourage innovation that allows us to provide a modern, safe, cost efficient transportation network for decades to come. And I think the key there is to get again, continue to focus on the entire network. This cannot be a discussion that only focuses on surface transportation. It has to be a discussion that looks at all modes of transportation and how they work together to the betterment of our residents. I'm looking forward to hearing from our keynote speaker, Jerry Buckwalter, the CEO of American Society of Civil Engineers, who will share his vision of what the future holds for transportation. And I am very pleased to welcome members of AASHTO's Research Advisory Council from the Departments of Transportation in Alaska, California, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Washington State, who are joining us for the first time this year. To our partners in California, our hearts go out to you as you continue to battle wildfires. I know New Jersey has benefited from the ideas and innovations that other states have come up with, 
and we hope that you will find the information shared helpful as well. In New Jersey, we often talk about the department's commitment to communities, so much so that it is a formal program here at the department. But that's what this conference is all about, working together to share best practices that make a positive difference and improve the quality of life for our communities. How we do that certainly has taken on different meaning in 2020. I'm not sure any of us could have expected what we've gone through this year. But in this difficult time, we try to look for silver linings. So despite the challenges that we have faced as a country and as, as a state, New Jersey Department of Transportation has continued our day-to-day -day business almost uninterrupted. That is a credit to our staff and our partners finding a way to get the job done, whether it's working at home, sometimes in the office or out in the field. In short, this pandemic has taught us the meaning of the phrase adaptive, to adapt and overcome, very similar to what we talk about in resiliency. We have come together to ensure that the transportation needs of the state have been fulfilled while ensuring everyone stays safe with the new protocols that are required. COVID-19 isn't the only challenge we face this year though. While so much of our focus has been on the pandemic, presidential election and civil unrest, around us in 2020, we have been marked by extreme weather conditions, some of which we've never seen before. As I said, the wildfires, wildfires in California and other Western states has been devastating. They continue to burn now, uh, so much so that I had a conversation with the president of IBTTA, um, which I participate in actively, and he's at the, the toll roads um, authority in California. And he said he sat from his window and watched his toll equipment just burn. I'm not sure many of us can visualize that or expect it um, other than the extraordinary tragedy we faced on 9-11. But this is something they're facing year in and year out, sometimes month in and month out. 2020 has seen unprecedented heat waves in the West and 80% of the region west of the Rocky Mountains is facing some level of drought. The fires in the US come on the heels of the worst fire season in Australia when 46 million acres, an area equal to 70, 2,000 square miles burned. Closer to home, this year's hurricane season has seen more storms than ever before. We're into Greek letter naming, which I think may be a first. Double an average year, and the intensity of this storm has been greater than in the past. And as we sit here today, we brace for the rains that will come from, uh, from Zeta. And I got, again, shout out to all of our friends at the Louisiana Department of Transportation, Sean Wilson, as they continue to brace for yet another landfall hurricane. In New Jersey, we've been fortunate that only tropical storm Faye and the rem remnants of hurricane Osasis hit the state with high winds, heavy rain and flooding. But we all know the danger and devastation hurricanes can bring. Tomorrow is the eighth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. We made it through that storm and our crews did incredible work in the days and weeks afterward to clear debris and reopen roads. We continue to do projects that result from the lessons learned from Superstorm Sandy. The department has since reconstructed more than 12 miles of Route 35 and improved the drainage system on the Barnegat Peninsula so the highway can better withstand another storm of that magnitude. So what lessons have we learned and how do we plan for a future where extreme weather due to climate change is the norm? That is the focus of this year's research showcase. Looking at our efforts to build resiliency into our transportation infrastructure so it can better withstand whatever mother nature throws our way. The department has created a resiliency working group to help plan for extreme weather events. This group is working to assess current practices throughout our department, identify gaps, and develop recommendations to ensure NJDOT remains resilient to the effects of climate change. The working group goals include issuing design guidance that incorporates measures to address resiliency, utilizing climate-related data that may assist in prioritizing future projects, enhanced maintenance activities that can serve as low-cost, effective ways to address resiliency and improved data gathering to better understand our vulnerabilities. In July, Tropical Storm Faye brought more rain in one day than we usually get in an entire month. 
Storms like that pose major flooding problems in our communities and our drainage systems are being tested as never before. The DOT remains, maintains a statewide drainage man management database to proactively determine vulnerable roadways and flooding hotspots. The system can identify areas that are impacted by frequent flooding related road closures for further evaluation. We routinely perform maintenance to repair broken or damaged infrastructure, sweep and remove debris, clean inlets and pipes, clear ditches and swales and add inlets if possible. If these flooding effects cannot be get mitigated by maintenance operations, they are sent to our capital program management group for further review where other message, measures such as elevation may be considered. We currently have a project in final design that will elevate flood prone sections of Route 40 in Egg Harbor Township and improve drainage. Identifying where we are vulnerable is part of the resiliency working groups efforts. We evaluate drainage issues and incorporate solutions where necessary in the design process of any project. For example, we strive to eliminate ponding on roadways and our regular resurfacing projects through adjusting grades and cross slopes, curb work and attention to resetting and repairing inlets. This type of work often reduces the impacts of flooding locations and improves the life and safety of the roadway. Another aspect of the resiliency working group is determining how critical a section of road or bridge may be. Factors include traffic volume, whether it is coastal evacuation route, and access to emergency services such as police, fire stations, and hospitals. Using this information, we can better plan our future projects to make sure our transportation system is able to continue operating in times of natural disaster. This will help ensure people can get out of harm's way and that emergency responders and utility companies can get where they need to go in times of crisis. In addition to our resiliency efforts, the department is exploring environmentally friendly transportation solutions to help combat climate change. One of the ways is to reduce our carbon footprint through an increase of use of electric vehicles. Last week, the governor proposed that by 2035, all cars sold in New Jersey would be electric vehicles. This is a major component of New Jersey's goal of reducing carbon emissions in the state by 80% by 2050, maybe by 100%, but we'll check that out. The four major New Jersey transportation agencies, NJDOT, New Jersey Transit, the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, and the South Jersey Transportation Authority are doing their part. We have come together to develop an electrification infrastructure so that we may begin the conversion of our light duty fleets to electric vehicles and do so in a way that allows for system compatibility that benefits all agencies. As we move to more electric vehicles on our roads, we'll have to find new revenue sources to replace the gas tax to fund our transportation projects. NJDOT is leading the current phase of the mileage based user fee study being conducted by the Eastern Transportation Coalition, formerly the I-95 Quarter Coalition. The purpose is to collect data to analyze the viability of such a system as a sustainable transportation funding source. None of us should take our eyes off the ball in Washington on the renewal of the Highway Trust Fund. We kick that can down the road quite a bit, and hopefully um, when we get past all the, all the, I'm not sure what the word is, um, excitement of next week, and um, we can get back down to business in Washington and really start to focus on the importance of transportation funding. But before concluding, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about one of my favorite aspects of the research showcase. It's NJDOT's Build a Better Mousetrap Award. The competition promotes finding solutions to every day on the job problems. Whether it's a new gadget that improves the quality and safety of a project or an innovative process that reduces costs and improves efficiency, it's typically the people on the front lines who discover the latest and best practices. The award recognizes NGDOT employees who find innovative ways to do their jobs. I'm very proud to announce that last year's award winner, the Marine Navigation Retro Reflective Markers Program, submitted by Gerald Olivito of the department's Operations Support and Engineering Team, also was recognized by AASHTO's 2020 Francis B. Francois Award. This national recognition re recognizes transportation innovation and New Jersey DOT's program is now being implemented by several states around the country. What is so important about this particular award 
is that it was an idea that was a simple off the shelf solution to a real safety hazard that could have otherwise been very expensive to fix. Bridges have navigation lights on them to help guide boats at night. When a light burns out, it requires an emergency replacement, which could be dangerous if it was being done at night and could co be costly because of overtime. Gerald's idea was to use retro reflective panels like we use on our highway signs to better identify bridge piers and serve as a backup system for navigation lighting. This simple solution enhances safety by increasing the visibility of the bridge fender system and identifying the channel margin should navigation lights fail. It is a low cost application that other transportation agencies can implement easily and quickly. This year, four ideas were submitted as part of the Build a Better Mousetrap competition. This is the most we've had since the competition started three years ago. It represents proof that NJDOT continues to create new and innovative ways to improve the transportation sector. I am very proud of the ingenuity demonstrated by these ideas and by these individuals and hope that to see this trend continue. If you have an idea on how we can do something better, I encourage you to pursue it so we can have even more submissions for next year's competition. This year's submission includes an anti-jackknife device submitted by, submitted by Scott Ainsley and Mark Crago from the NGDOT Operations Training Unit and the Freehold Garage. They noticed new employees training for their commercial driver's license test often drag, jackknife the trailer, damaging, causing damage to the vehicles. Scott and Mark developed an early warning device to help prevent jackknives and reduce damage to our equipment. The second idea was submitted by James Nunn from our Central Region Operations. It diverts grass and pebbles from mowers to prevent the debris from shooting out into the road. This helps ensure the safety of the driving public while maintaining high productivity for our crews. The third submission was the NJDOT Bridge Navigator submitted by Asmin Zaman from Drawbridge Operations. This is an app that works on all mobile devices to help personnel in the field find their way to bridges and fuel stations. And last but not least, there was a signal, traffic signal explorer submitted by Brandon Rawl of our Bureau of Traffic Engineering. This was a multi-year project that unifies all of the traffic engineering data sets into one comprehensive signal database of all 2,800 state managed traffic signals and sign based flashing control devices. The signal explorer has a custom map tailored for use by the Bureau's engineers to include information most relevant to them and has the look and feel of Google Maps. I'm excited to see which idea will win the award and if it will have benefits beyond our state. While we're talking about awards, I wanna mention that in the past two years, NJDOT has received 29 awards for 19 projects and two project managers have been recognized as well. That's because of the innovation and dedication of so many of you. Besides the Francois Award, two NJDO projects received regional recognition from AASHTO in its annual competition. The first is the Route 280, Route 21 Interchange Improvement Project that won the Operations Excellence Medium Project category. The second is for the Route 72 Manahawk and Bay Bridges Project, Contract 4, which received the Regional Quality of Life Community Development Medium Project Award. The Manahawk and Bay Bridges Project was subsequently selected as a finalist in the 2020 America's Transportation Awards competition. With only 12 projects from across the country selected to compete, making this is quite an honor. I know that the winner is going to be announced next month at our AASHTO annual meeting. But whether we win or not, and trust us, we're competitive, don't get me wrong. Being selected is a recognition of the excellent work that's happening here in New Jersey because of the efforts of so many of you. Oftentimes, adversity is the engine of ingenu ingenuity and innovation. At the New Jersey Department of Transportation, we understand our responsibility to the people of the state extends far beyond roads and bridges. We are dedicated to the safety of everyone traveling through New Jersey, as well as the growth and success of the state's communities. My hope is that through collaborative efforts among <clears throat> transportation experts and academia, we will come through this difficult year stronger and better able to serve our communities. I will join Mike in offering some well-deserved thanks to all who pitched in to make this event possible. Thank you for your hard work to support the New Jersey Department of Transportation and for your time today. And while I absolutely love prepared remarks um, in this particular time, because I think the weirdest part of delivering remarks is that I can't see you, um, but you can see me, is to remind you of the value every one of you bring in helping us to continue to improve. 
I'm so excited to have our Ashto states participating. They will bring new vision and new ideas to us um, as they not only critique what we do, which is a good thing. We want them to do that. We want them to help us be better, but hopefully we help them be better too. Um, you know, I often say in New Jersey that the interstate system, which we share, is really the ribbon of roads that ties us together as a single country. And that's who we are. We're the United States of America. And when we travel, um, just look out the window, you'll get on 295. Well, not where you are, but where I am. I look out the window and I'll get on 295 and within five minutes, I'll be in Pennsylvania. And within 45 minutes, I'll be in Delaware. And within 15 minutes, I'll be in Maryland. It's important for us to all work together. It's important for us to collaborate together, to share ideas. Um, you know, keeping your light under a bushel, whether it's it's the gifts you get as a human or the, the knowledge and expertise you have in transportation doesn't help anybody. Uh, we need you to shine that light. We need you to share and to be not to be afraid to suggest things, even if they don't sound necessarily complex. Some of the best collaboration is really simple ideas. And one of the best examples we have is the work we've done in Lambertville to solve a relatively simple transportation project that we made so complex, it took us 20 years to get to the simple answer. But in doing it, we made a whole town happy. When we do that, that's the ultimate success. So from the most simple to the most complex, every idea has value. I hope that you enjoy your time with the research showcase. I hope it is as, as informative and beneficial as it would be if we were sitting in front of each other. Um, and now I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Valeria Remvoza, the De Deputy Division Director of the Federal Highway Administration's New Jersey Division Office. Have a wonderful showcase, everyone. Uh, Commissioner, uh, and thank you so much for introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 22nd Annual NJDOT's Research Showcase. I hope you and your families are doing well and thank you so much for connecting to this first time virtual event. Federal Highway Administration is happy to support and to be a part of the NGDOT's research showcase funded through the statewide planning and research program commonly known as the SPNR. As you know, among other efforts, this program funds and supports development and implementation of management systems, plans and processes, and research, development, and technology transfer activities necessary for planning, design, construction, ma management, and maintenance of highway, public transportation, and intermodal transportation facilities. The resiliency is the same of this year's uh, research showcase. The Del Highway Administration Office of Natural Environment, Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center, and field offices just like ours, New Jersey Division, support and encourage resiliency planning projects and related efforts. The goal of these efforts is to find ways for reducing emissions, designing sustainable highways, saving energy. Extreme weather, as Commissioner talked about, changes in sea levels and environmental conditions compromise the substantial federal investment in transportation infrastructure. Federal Highway works with states and metropolitan areas to increase the health and longevity of the nation's highway diligently assisting with assessing vulnerabilities, considering resilience in the transportation planning process, incorporating resilience in asset management plans, addressing resilience in project development and design, optimizing operations and maintenance practices. One of the greatest NGDOT's nationwide leadership and contribution to resiliency program was their selection to participate and successfully completing the Federal Highway Administration 2017-2019 pilot program on asset management, extreme weather, and proxy indicators. And JDOT's project focused on identifying the root cause of flooding and most effective risk management mitigation strategies. Findings of this project 
were included in the Transportation Asset Management Plan, or known as TAM. This NJDOT's accomplishment was recently highlighted in a virtual peer exchange hosted by Federal Highway Administration on September 22nd. Thank you, John Rigi, for your great presentation. Another example of NJDOT's partner's success is development of a resiliency plan, criticality tool, and flood risk visualization tool, about which you will hear tomorrow from John Carnegie uh, of Rutgers VTC. I'd like to recognize NJDOT's lead, Elkins Green, and his team for being a part of New Jersey Interagency Council on Climate Resilience. We are confident and JDOT's leadership on this effort will result in the development of the comprehensive 2022 PAM. Improving resilience when planning, designing, maintaining, and repairing transportation assets yields cost savings in the long term through so reduced repair costs, improved safety, and reduced travel disruption. I'd like to highlight a few examples of the NJDOT's completed and upcoming breach resiliency projects. Maintenance breach fender replacement contract was recently completed to replace and upgrade 60-year-old breach fenders at four structures in Cape May County. The project was the first of its kind in the state to protect bridges, piers from boat impacts, floating debris during flooding, and provide an overall safety upgrade to the waterway. Gerald Oliveto, project engineer in NJDOT's operations support group, was instrumental in successful delivery of this project. Another project for installation of SCOUR countermeasures at 14 state-owned bridges has been designed for 500-year flood event. The NJDOT SCOUR analysis found the structures at the highest risk of substructure stability loss during flood events. The countermeasures to be installed are being designed in accordance with Federal Highway Administration guidelines with the group uh, of bridges to have their SCOUR countermeasures installed in 2022. NJDOT's Structural Evaluation Group, led by Greg, Greg Renman and NJDOT's Operations Support Group, led by Parts Oza, have teamed up to ensure the successful completion of this important resiliency project. We would also like to recognize our NJDOT's partners' effort in organizing this first virtual event, uh, which organized every year efficiently utilizing Federal Highway Administration Technology Transfer or T-Square funds. Special kudos to Mike Russo, Andy Swartz, Amanda Gendek, and their team. In the planning arena, the NJTPA contributed by including, uh, including resiliency in corridor level planning. NJTPA's Passaic River Basin Climate Resiliency Planning Study was recently highlighted in another peer exchange hosted by Federal Highway Administration and Minnesota Division, uh, I'm sorry, Minnesota DOT on October 13th. Thank you, Jennifer Fagliana, for presenting. All these works continue to be done in the close and JDOT's Bureau of Research Partnership with Rutgers University, Rutgers VTC, Rutgers Kate, Rutgers Rhyme, Stevens Institute, and JIT, Stockton, Rowan, Monmouth Universities, and UTRC for successfully moving forward the research program focused on topics such as asset management, traffic control, work zone safety, congestion, and resiliency. And finally, I want to highlight an opportunity for you to check the Federal Highway Administration Office of Natural Environment website 
for guidance, reports, and funding opportunities related to resiliency planning. This website has recently published information on CMAC toolkit, uh, alternative fuel corridor designation, and nature-based resilience for coastal highways report and webinars. You can also sign up for sustainability or resiliency update. Enjoy the event and the great presentations throughout the 22nd Annual NJDOT Research Showcase. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. It's always, it's always a pleasure to have you be part of our research showcase. I believe with that, uh, we hand it back to Ted Green or to David. Okay, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Valeria, for that uh, presentation, as well as the commissioner and assistant commissioner. Uh, at this time, we were going to have our keynote uh, speaker. He's not on at the moment, so therefore, we're going to take a break. But before we take a break, I'd like to, you could, Ted, bring up that slide. It's New Jersey is working with the Eastern Transportation Coalition on a pilot study to explore a mileage-based user fee as a possible sustainable solution for transportation funding. New Jersey Department of Transportation needs real drivers like you to help collect important data, even if you're staying close to home. It's easy to participate and your privacy, privacy is guaranteed. Enroll via the web link shown, which I see it's on the screen now, on this slide, plug a device into your vehicle for two months and tell us what you think by reviewing simulated statements. Hence a project to anticipate, reimagine, and prepare for future changes. Here to deliver this presentation is Jerry Buckwalter. Jerry's background includes serving as a director of corporate strategy for Northrop Grumman where he also directed the company's business in Homeland Security and Resilience. Jerry has decades of experience working with infrastructure, including membership in the National Infrastructure Advisory Council, for four years reporting to the White House under both Pre President Barack Obama and George W. Bush. He is currently the Chief Operating and Strategy Officer for the American Society of Civil Engineers and the exciting ASCE Society of Civil Engineers uh, Future World Vision. It is my honor to introduce the keynote address speaker, Jerry Buckwalter. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to participate with you today and to present our Future World Vision project. The American Society of Civil Engineers wanted to be thought leaders in looking at the future, and we wanted to look far enough into the future to ensure we didn't just extrapolate a view of the future that was not much different than the present. We started with research and future trends and a classic future scenario analysis. That has been completed. And now we are uh, creating a computer model by which we visualize those results. Today, I will show you several elements of the status of the project. Next slide. There are a large number of and variety of global changes coming our way, and they are hugely interconnected. We've experienced lots of change in the past, but it's rare to see this many vectors of change impacting us in a relatively short period. Everything from technology such as automation, autonomy, and the Internet of Things, to alternate energy, climate change, demographic changes, smart infrastructure, and new materials, all of which will impact the built environment. We are also creating multidimensional ways to look at it, various layers or lenses, so that it's not just another version of a SimCity game. Next slide. These dimensions allow us to examine the energy construct, the transportation systems, the water, and the wastewater elements, and so forth. That is how an engineer can provocate about how useful today's designs are for future problems. 
And more importantly, things that we do now that in fact are not good solutions 50 years from now. That allows us to take the right steps toward life cycle resilience with both the present and the future properly considered. Next slide. And we never look at any dimension or trend in isolation. I mentioned how these trends converge. So I show this slide to remind ourselves that we never should look at any trend in isolation. This is a graphic from one of the scenarios we analyzed to help think through the multidimensional convergence and cascading impact and cause and effect that keeps happening among all these trends. We've embraced a holistic perspective. Next slide. As a conclusion to the analytic part, the research yielded a few key transformational imperatives that engineers need to embrace in order to design and build the desired future built environment that is plausible in 50 years. I'm going to just point out a few of these. One, the world is focused on climate change as well as should be, but changes in demographics and urbanization patterns will have an equal, if not greater impact. Two, we will be dealing with a world that is digital in everything which creates the world of autonomy, AI, and so forth. Three, we won't know what technological advances will specifically occur, but we can be sure that there will be things like quantum computing, synthetic biology, and new materials. Lastly, the fourth industrial revolution represents the nexus of all these trends, which will force us to understand system dynamics. Now, while much of the future built environment will not be, be apparent for many years, the first steps should be taken now to prepare for it. If we wait for the nature, the exact nature of our future infrastructure to become obvious, we will be too late to optimize society's use of it and our risks to build it. Next slide. Next, we decided we needed to create the stories that reach the heart and mind of all of us. I learned a long time ago, uh, people just won't read hundreds of pages of research as I so often do. Uh, so the Future World Project will create an immersive environment with evocative visuals, characters, and narratives. We want everyone to really imagine five communities of the world 50 years in the future, all designed to be radically different and provocative. So we are creating virtual worlds from a very macro citywide view right down to a neighborhood view so users can really begin to understand how they will live. And engineers can explore, collaborate, and consider how they can make the future a better place to live. Next slide. These are the five city worlds, city worlds is what we're calling these, that we selected. They will emerge and evolve in this approximate timeline. And the ones further out on the timeline are obviously more speculative than the ones that emerge sooner. This chart shows just a few of the ingredients that help us create these future communities. In addition to speculation based on our research, we also model innovations from a variety of disciplines and a few relatively unpredictable disruptions. Future World Vision is not attempting to predict the future. It is a tool by which we ask ourselves questions about the future, so we are not surprised by those unexpected conditions if they occur or caught off guard in having prepared for them. And for those inquiring minds, back in 2018 when we started this project, we did consider a highly infectious global pandemic as one of our three potential major disruptions. Next slide. I'm now going to play a short video describing the Future World Vision project. To take a look out 50 years is not typical. 
But we felt with so many changes, we had to free ourselves from today's constraints and take a step out that far. We're here to create a professional tool rooted in a future that's highly plausible because we're doing deep research with renowned experts in their field. Because 60% of the world's population live in coastal areas, we're starting with the floating city. Engineers have built nations over thousands of years. Now we will need to become masters at systems integration. This is going to be a very exciting ride. Uh, the current activity, we started with the floating city, the current activity is focused on creating our mega city, looking at the implications associated with massive urban density and the quality of life for those who live in it. This is the one city where we will also take a very deliberate approach to preserving and or updating existing infrastructure since the foundations for megacities lie in the existing large cities of the world. With the megacity, we are currently fine-tuning our different lenses. We will visualize different communities within it, but we will also have differing granularity levels from a systems view to a district view to a street view all the way down to a building view. At various locations among the districts, we will have what we call core samples where the user can drill down to very specific information on the various components of that sample, which is where the various engineering disciplines can obtain more nuanced research and information. Next slide. Research for the megacity is conducted primarily on the phenomena of today. We take the real-time data from various cities around the world and combine those in a mix to make up our megacity. By doing so, we ground our starting position in the real world as much as possible. Next slide. We have another key snapshot at the 25 year point based on informed speculation. This speculation is still rooted in the data that we gather on current research, advancements planned, or speculated on by the broad infrastructure community based on future architectural designs and testing plans of laboratories around the globe. Next slide. Our long-term vision is driven to a great extent by fundamental science advancements projected in 50 years. As you can see by the images shown here, it is driven by projections in biology synthetic biology, chemistry, and materials science, all guided by forecasted future end states related to big data, autonomy, nano sensors, and so forth. Next slide. The megacity will also show progression over time, but in the megacity, that progression starts, as I said, with an existing city ecosystem. So the beginning point will look quite familiar. Next slide. Much of the future city landscape then builds layer upon layer from that starting position. This is the one feature that will remain unique to the megacity. We have deliberately chosen not to treat the megacity as a greenfield type of development. Next slide. An example of that more greenfield development is our floating city. So I'll use some of the material from that to show the evolution of that kind of new community. If we just describe the floating city 50 years from now, it would seem like science fiction. So we take incremental snapshots showing the evolution of the city. We show the horizontal expansion and growth of the city 
and the vertical expansion above the water surface, subsurface, and on the ocean floor. We also show the evolution of the types of structures that get created to enable a viable self-sustaining floating community. Those structures support essential life-sustaining needs such as power, housing, food, water, and transportation, but they also support entertainment, education, the arts, and cultural events. Next slide. Large cities are not homogenous. There are clearly downtown centers, industrial hubs, green space, and so on. The nature of those differing city elements will change over time, but the existence of a variety of communities within a megacity will still be a fundamental premise that we retain. Next slide. We will demonstrate that by having, excuse me, uh, with this, by having six different districts. They are shown in these images. Some will be familiar. For example, the regenerative community is a decaying area of blight in the city of today that is reconstituted to become a vibrant part of the new city. We will simply envision how that might happen differently. On the other hand, some districts may be less familiar. Our adaptive corridor, industrial and tech center, and energy and agricultural sector combine elements of technology, education, transportation, and community, and even personal life in new patterns that are currently less familiar to us. Next slide. As we develop the megacity, in fact, as we develop all our cities, we have two overarching themes that infuse every element of the city. The digital and virtual worlds will join the analog and physical worlds. The merging of these worlds will continue unabated, despite some hurdles yet to be cleared. And the principles of circular economies will be universal. So we will explore everything from resilience to sustainability, to consumption, to regenerative reuse, to social equity. Next slide. To that point, at ASCE, we are uniquely focused on resilience and sustainability. We create vulnerability assessment tools for the entire development community which can definitively reduce the risks associated with the built environment due to disruptive events and conditions. Secondly, we are developing a rigorous global engineering standard for sustainable and resilient infrastructure. A guideline, not a set of principles, but a true engineering standard that can be used in infrastructure design and development and ultimately in which engineers can be certified. These tools will go a long way to helping de-risk every phase of an infrastructure project and ensure the ultimate achievement of our resilience goals from a long-term perspective. Next slide. In order to give everyone a better feel for using Future World Vision when we complete it, I will use this early version of the floating city that we displayed at the American Society of Civil Engineers annual convention in Miami last October. For those who were not there, this is a short two-dimensional excerpt from the three-dimensional experience using the VR goggles.
the feedback that we have received regarding this project has been overwhelmingly positive and indicate to us that the Future World Vision participants understand the cultural change that we believe is going to happen in the engineering profession over you know, this period of time. To demonstrate that, I'm gonna play these excerpts from the interviews that we conducted at that same convention in Miami, and we'll roll the next video. Today represents the nine month mark in a four year development project by which civil engineers and many other engineering disciplines will be able to talk together to start thinking about how to solve tomorrow's problems. We call this a provocation machine. It is designed to create a new kind of thinking in, in the younger generations. Many of the older engineers, of the really well-established engineers, are the ones who are most excited about this. If you go out on the floor, you will see engineers in their 70s and 80s with VR goggles on saying, wow. And right next to them, an engineer in their 20s who's saying, wow. This isn't looking at a plan set or some technical diagram. This is an immersive experience. It carries a wow factor and a sense of understanding. I was kind of scared at first. I'm scared of heights. And so I didn't realize that I was going to be feeling the feelings that I would feel in the real world through the VR experience. Um, when it went underwater, I, I literally was weak in the stomach. It felt that good, the graphics were that good, and the, the movement was that real to me. It more than exceeded my expectations. And the use of this technology will cement the civil engineering industry as being on the forefront of innovation. So I teach at a graduate level, but also do outreach to high schools and grade schools. And so I think this would be a great tool to allow them to get excited about what's going on in engineering. In my 37 years of membership at ASCE, this is the most inspiring, motivating thing. I can't wait to share it with other people in our industry. The validation that the imagination that every engineer uses all the time. The fact that you can put this into a VR virtual reality format and let everybody live your imagination is fantastic. And we can build it together. It's so exciting. This is gonna allow us to get ahead of the game. The sessions that we run at this conference are designed to inform, but they're also designed to be a massive market test, if you will. We're really looking for the feedback. We can take that feedback and make sure our end product is as fine-tuned as we possibly can. So, so far we've developed the floating city from 2030 through 2050. Oh, I think there's huge benefit to having everybody working together. You can be critical or you can be supportive of ideas that are inside this space. Any contribution you make is gonna change the space. There's this great, um, opportunity that goes beyond collaboration, it goes into a partnership for change. Someone says something, the next person takes that thought and carries it to another point. It comes back and keeps growing and expanding on itself. That's the benefit of collaborative group effort. And whatever we can imagine, uh, we can create. The Future World Vision will help drive us forward in multiple ways. It's going to attract the engineer of tomorrow, but it's also going to get us out of our space, out of our codes and standards where we typically practice and make us think, well, what, what do I have to build if that's the future? If we continue to collaborate, we can build something that is very robust and that allows the members of ASCE to contribute to the vision that we all would like to see. The value of this tool is to benefit civil engineers right now. When you see change coming, infrastructure has to change with it because believe it or not, we have clients who are already thinking about those things. We believe the Future World Vision Project can have a great impact on our industry and on our profession. We think it has the potential to help us make progress 
toward those transformational imperatives that I previously spoke about, promoting systems thinking, taking a multidisciplinary approach, creating a common collaborative platform for everyone, exciting the next generation, and sparking innovation and creativity. Next slide. Our hope is that those of you who help us optimize the potential of future world vision will become the global network of academic institutions and practitioners that help engineers become the designers and builders that create the future infrastructure we desire, including the radically different future built environment that's possible. And over time, we can create a future planning tool and environment that's constantly learning and evolving among global universities, research centers, and all vested organizations. And finally, my thanks to Rutgers University for being a key sponsor and champion of this project with ASCE. Next slide. Thank you for giving me time to present the Future World Project today. ASCE is committed to being an active collaborator and ally to serve city and state governments, urban planners, communities, and all vested partners. But the engineer can no longer simply say, tell me what you want me to design and build. That is not an effective way to manage the conditions of the future. Engineers have significant and unique input into creating the infrastructure that will serve the intended purpose, be resilient, enhance public safety, preserve the environment, preserve culture, and create an equitable society. Thank you again for letting me join your research showcase today. And Ted, I'm gonna turn it back to see if we have some questions or answers, if there's time for that. Yes, we do have time for questions. Uh, please, if you do have any questions, place them in the chat box. Make sure that's addressed to either uh, all attendees or to everyone. I can see both of those. Uh, thank you for all the people who have been doing comments. Uh, that's been a good discussion going off on the side there. So for mega cities, uh, if so, the mega cities are taking smaller city municipal areas and combining them, like Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, becoming a sole entity in a sense. So they're asking as a question. So I, we, we believe based upon the research that we see uh, that we've been doing is that we're going to see two phenomena, maybe three. Yes, there is this broader horizontal aggregation that occurs over a fairly long period of time. So you get that Dallas Fort Worth effect. Heck, we, we, we think that there's actually, if you go far enough out in the future, you almost see an entire Boston to Washington East Coast effect that becomes a corridor, if you will, that starts to take on its own life as its own regional entity. However, my point too is, if you make assumptions on some new materials that uh, research is being done on now, um, then I think verticality starts to kick in as well. So in our mega city, uh, just give you an example. We're actually going to look at uh, verticality 200 stories and higher because of new materials. We will be looking at air transportation, air transit, air taxi portals, every 10 floors of a high rise building so that building to building transit occurs without actually going down to the ground. So we will be looking at both the horizontal and the vertical expansion in a 50 year period of time based upon new materials. Um, we also believe that with that verticality will come a lot of robotics. So you'll see, for instance, uh, robotic delivery of the building components at those heights. Building components will play a role of both that is both structural and in being part of a sensor network. So it will actually report automatically its installation in the structure, its connectivity to its sister components, and its active use as a sensor as well as a structural element. So we, we're looking way ahead at the vertical and the horizontal. 
The last point I'll make is the next city we intend to do as we raise funds to do that is what we call the rural city. And we believe that is not, while it is the antithesis of the mega city, it's a very vibrant distributed uh, set of communities. They actually play symbiotically with each other. So even when you have a mega city, we believe that it will combine in natural ways with rural communities that in the future will be more distant than typical commuting distances that we see now because we will have even more virtual connection and thereby you will be able to have high quality of life with virtual and high speed connections, physical connections uh, to the mega city and the mega city will end up with uh, being the lodestone of some of those very unique academic and research and medical, uh, you know, kinds of things, as well as uh, big events. Um, so it's horizontal and vertical, and it's actually in symbiosis with rural communities, much more than we have now in our typical suburbia phenomena right now. How can we as transportation practitioners help you with your world vision? So, uh, I think there's two ways uh, to to consider for the practitioners. Uh, uh, so let me let me first point out that the universities have been, uh, to my surprise, our our first adopters, if you will. Um, in addition to Rutgers, in the last four months, I've probably briefed over 20 universities, and we're actually developing a future World Vision primer which is a five module freshman university engineering course so that the details of how you do scenario planning, future, future thought, how you visualize and create a collaborative platform, and then how, how, you, how you spark creativity within a disciplined engineering discipline um, is in its final few weeks of, uh, of creation, and we're gonna be distributing that shortly. But on the practitioner side, I would offer two ways. One, people should feel free to even, you can distribute my email and send me because we have a core practitioner team that's looking at a variety of ways practitioners can apply this tool in their practice. Um, and so we're open to all suggestions. I would suggest the second one, and I'm gonna give an example. Um, a second way is if you're in a, a practicing firm, a consulting firm, for instance, where you do some strategic planning, this is an ideal tool to change the way you do strategic planning, which for most companies in, and now I'm speaking very broadly about lots of industries, uh, most industries do strategic planning by a bunch of smart people sitting around the table and telling what they uh, they believe the future looks like five to 10 years out. Uh, that's okay, but it, it creates blind spots and it rarely looks out far enough to anticipate potential disruptions. So using the future world vision tool as a strategic planning aid, I think helps what I call, uh, reduce what I call orthogonal risk, things that just blindside you that you hadn't anticipated. And while you don't need to fix everything now, you need to at least be alert to those. You wanna be alert to the signposts, the signals that indicate those things might happen. And that way you as a practitioner and your companies can react more quickly. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, we actually looked at a pandemic and I was distressed for obvious reason when COVID-19 phenomena occurred, but I was even more distressed that all of the things that I saw on TV was a dialogue between epidemiologists and what I call uh, healthcare behaviorists. What's the virus going to do? And how do we get people to do the right things? 
engineers were absent. And engineers that touch, in, that, that touch the built environment, that touch infrastructure, are problem solvers. And we are the ones who could have added to that conversation and hopefully will add to that conversation as subsequent waves occur so that the dialogue is not just about the virus and our behavior, but what are the things that we could do with our built environment that would make the practice, the lifestyle, the quality of life improve as we go through this. And so, for instance, in Future World Vision, when we look at, and I'm going to use transportation as an example, when we looked at a 50-year phenomena and we considered um, a, a highly infectious pandemic, uh, we drew several conclusions. One was in the early reactions to a pandemic, everything becomes virtual and transportation diminishes greatly, particularly public transportation and public transit. In the five to 25 year uh, time range, the, the transportation itself changes to accommodate those kinds of things. So for instance, privatized compartments emerge in a different way and the actual vehicles get reconstructed. Ingress and egress patterns are adopted to keep the flow with people socially distant and those kinds of things. So all sorts of things occur that get people moving again in a safer way. If you actually look out 50 years, what we discovered was there's a reasonable chance that antimicrobial fabrics and wearables emerge such that the proximity, the social distancing issue actually gets reduced to almost zero and people can return to a more dense transportation mode because of the, the change in the personal wearables that become resistant to these things and protective of these things. Now, I think we are wonderful in our transportation planning, but I, it's rare to see anybody think that far ahead to think about, well, what does that sequence look like and how do I accommodate that if that's a plausible path this might take when in fact I'm building an asset that has a life cycle of 50 years, 100 years, 150 years. And so how can it evolve to accommodate those other changing phenomena in a transportation example and I just use the global pandemic as one example. We actually considered several other disruptive events like a global food, uh, food supply failure uh, based upon a GMO uh, factor um, and, and some others. And again, not that we're predicting any of them, but when you're, I'm using transportation as an example, once you consider that, you think through a long life cycle transportation uh, element uh, very differently, and you can't solve it all, but at least now you're alert to, and you can watch for the signposts that might indicate um, that um, we're going to uh, probably occur uh, relative to pandemics, which by the way, um, when I when I think about that, uh, it, I always put that in, the, I used to put that in the category I call um, low probability, high consequence kind of events. But if you look back over several hundred years, in fact, a global pandemic is actually nearly 100% probability at some point in time. We just have no clue when it will occur. Um, this is a tool to help with that orthogonal surprise, if you will. So I use that as an example to show how we use this tool as a practitioner to think through those things. I'll give you uh, one more example, if I may. Um, I was in touch, I, I, I did some consulting for a, a civil engineering consulting firm who actually took a contract to look at the early design of transportation uh, landing structures that would be on the top of Los Angeles airport, which could land and recharge electric 
autonomous air vehicles and deliver passengers to downtown Los Angeles. Now, the, the, that, that is a contract that's actually already been completed. Um, the interesting part of that is that the Los Angeles transportation authorities are not the ones that consulted that. Google was the one who uh, paid for that as it starts to think about future phenomena. And the CEO of that firm said to me, it was an exciting project. They knew they were working on a design that was just a, a plausible design that could help Google anticipate the future. But he said, it would have been so nice to have Future World Vision as a software tool so that they could actually not just do the design Google asked them to, but that they could use Future World Vision to help their client, Google, think through all the elements of what downtown LA would actually look like in that period of time, because Google hadn't really thought about that. They were just thinking about the landing spots. And that way they could look at a more holistic and become more of a partner with Google in that civil engineering consulting contract that they took. So I use that as an example that a CEO actually shared with me. Uh, next question, I'll combine two. Uh, were unforeseen weather events taken into account, such as uh, we currently can't build some oil rigs to withstand a strong hurricane, how will the floating city survive? We sure did. And again, we, we are actually looking in the floating city at several options to that. Um, and we did take the current phenomena into effect. We're actually looking at potential mechanisms that would not only stabilize, but would actually cause the city, which is not a highly vertical city uh, when it's a floating city uh, for obvious reasons, uh, and actually, uh, actually submerge it during high events and bring it back up. Uh, and so that, for instance, is a very different approach. So we're exploring a variety of things like that. We're actually working with um, Blue 21, which is a, a European Union sponsored research group out of Rotterdam, who collects a lot of the floating city research from all around the world uh, on some of the early uh, experiments being done. And so we're, we're projecting forward a variety of mechanisms, but yes, absolutely. We are looking at the unique harsh environment of the saltwater. We're looking at the unique weather events of near shore and deep water. And we are also looking at just as important as it as that is, we're also looking at the um the environmental impact. Um, you know, this is a chance for engineers to think well in advance of if you were going to do a floating city, how do you make sure we don't just design the future floating city slums of tomorrow? Uh, or we cause the environmental degradation. So how do you have healthy ecology subsurface where you're actually growing your own food, very different kind of food, and, um, and, and creating a healthy ecosystem subsurface as well as surface. So we're looking that at that phenomena just as much as we're looking at the environmental and weather event phenomena. But yes, we, we have considered all of that. The next question is, uh, are any of the five types of cities being built currently, concept cities? Uh, you may have to repeat that one for me again, Ted. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, are any of the five city types currently being constructed? Okay, so interesting. Not in the full form that you see them, but we do see see some early versions, um, very early in the evolutionary stage, though. So, for instance, um, Mega City is the one where we see huge elements already occurring. And there you can look at China, who's treating that more as a greenfield project, not the way we're doing ours, but you, we can pick up phenomena 
where we see some of those things happening. We see areas outside the US that are, for instance, already regulating autonomous ground vehicle and air vehicle passenger traffic. Switzerland, for instance, just just embraced what a uh, national personal air travel would look like with autonomous vehicles. Um, US has such a scale, it's difficult for us. We're, we're, we're nowhere near that yet. Um, so we're seeing elements that we feature in a mega city already in bits and pieces starting. The rural city, not so much yet. Uh, there we're going to be looking at uh, huge drought conditions. We're actually going to look at the desert conditions for the global south and how do you create a uh, healthy agricultural phenomena uh, under pretty austere conditions. And I don't see much of that happening yet, except in very small experiments. Um, floating city, uh, I, a year ago, two years ago, I would have said not much, but there is huge movement as our island nations begin to submerge, uh, people really starting to work on small projects there to experiment with what's feasible. So I'm, I'm seeing some progress there. Two that are much uh, further out, obviously, are our frozen city. Uh, and there we don't see hardly anything yet, except in some research infrastructure in Antarctica. And in fact, we did a lot of research with the folks who live down there as we postulate what that might look like. Um, that one actually worries me a lot because it might come sooner than we think. As sea level rises a year and a half ago, approximately a year and a half ago, the first cargo container ship just passed through the Arctic Straits. I'm not sure people understood how significant that was. Relative to global supply chain, you can move anything from any place in the world to another place in the world through the Arctic Straits versus Panama Canal, Suez Canal, Malacca Straits, etc. at anywhere from a 50% to an 80% savings. When you see economics like that, the world's global supply chain will begin to come through the Arctic Straits. And that will require infrastructure built on the permafrost to support the world's global supply chain movement through that region. I think we're way behind in anticipating what that looks like. And the world economics will actually force it to happen faster than we think. The last one, just early scientific research. There are companies now actually working on materials that have been returned from the Mars rover to look at what early structure elements could be created with those materials, um, because certainly it's too expensive to haul materials there. And there are actually contracts already underway with NASA to build, the, for instance, Boeing has the contract to build the engines that could take uh, uh, manned uh, uh, vessels to Mars. And there are companies that have been started to actually mine the fuel from the asteroids to fuel it in its route. Now, those are really early. So those are purely on the scientific stage yet. So I would say the early versions we see right now are mostly elements of the mega city. And to my surprise, the floating city now has some emerging uh, work being done as well. Uh, how is property ownership dealt with under the concept of floating cities? We have a whole team working on what we call the governance and legal construct. That one's going to be interesting. So we are going to explore different ways because it gets even more complex than that. Property ownership almost becomes a start from scratch phenomena and almost becomes what is not only property ownership, what does rule of law look like? What does policing look like? What does national sovereignty look like, depending upon how far offshore this, uh, this is? And we're going to explore all elements of governance because there will be a chance for this to be nation state rivalry that will then boil down to property ownership, or this could be a chance for nation states to get together and actually experiment with something cut from whole cloth 
that maybe avoids some of the negatives we have in every nation state of the world right now. So we're, we're going to, we have, actually have a team of, of legal people uh, who've done a lot of future studies actually helping us with uh, governance issues. And I put property ownership in that. We're gonna explore several different models. Uh, in the mega city model, what are the roles, what will people's interaction will be at street level? If people do not need to go down to the ground floor to connect with others, is it possible that some current interactions between people would be reduced? And what will be the developing, what will, how will that affect developing community and people's need for interaction with others? I love that question. Um, and here's what we're going to explore. We're going to explore both a functional, a desired outcome, and a somewhat dysfunctional, because I find that we learn by looking at the dysfunctional outcome. If we allow this to be strictly building to building human interconnection, I think we have a horrible possibility of huge dysfunction at the ground level. We have this, we might make very much worse our haves and have nots situation that we've got going on in social and economic equity around the, the world. Um, so we're going to explore what happens at the ground floor if you neglect it because we're so enamored with the aerial connections that are possible or the high speed connections or virtual connections that are possible. But we're also going to explore what I call a very healthy maker community. That in fact, if we pay attention, it's a good balance of the two. There'll be air to air and virtual connections, but there'll be healthy reasons why you can go down to the ground floor. Even if you have aerial gardens and, and green space, you can turn the ground plane into a great uh, agricultural uh, benefit, green space benefit, and a maker community and a variety of things so that there's equal attractiveness to both visiting the ground plane and the aerial connections. I, I think it's a matter of balancing the two. And if we don't pay attention to both, we have huge potential for a dysfunctional outcome. Shouldn't long-range plans that are be being developed today take world, uh, future world vision into account somehow? How would that occur, or does that already occur? I don't think it occurs much. So, uh, again, and, and even though I lead this project, um, you know, engineers are today, are, are the problem solvers of the world. Uh, and we have plenty to keep us busy. My goal is just to take 5% of every engineer's time, 5% uh, of any en engineering organization's time, any department of transportation's time, and just say, just take 5% iteratively and think through whether what you're doing now looks like it's good for five years, 25 years, and 50 years and think about it very honestly, and that will help us make better decisions um, uh, from a whole life cycle standpoint, from a performance-based thinking standpoint, but it will also help us become long-range planners. I, I don't think we do much of that. That's, that's, not, that's not being derogatory, it's just, and I'm not talking about just civil engineering. I'm, I'm talking about every industry uh, in the world rarely thinks far enough ahead uh, and therefore gets caught by surprise by something at some point in time. Um, this is simply a way that I think people can use this. And it's nothing more than than using this aid to help provoke you to think about something that you just normally wouldn't think about. Because as engineers, we're so used to problem solving that usually the problem is already fairly well defined. Therefore, our thinking is already self-constrained because we're focused on solving that problem. There's nothing wrong with it. The world needs us to do that. I'm just trying to find 5% of everybody's neuron power and just break lock for a moment and think about something that's plausible but not well defined and in fact is highly uncertain because then even when you're solving today's problems 
In the back of your mind, you'll be looking for the signals that whether the mega city is going to actually develop the way I show it, because we state our assumptions in that, is actually happening or it's not happening or it's happening differently. That's why we've built in a plan to actually update every five years our visual model based upon the professional debate that we want to actually occur and us watching the, the signals from the environment. And then we can make mods to that over time based upon well-vetted professional debate on, on whether these things are actually happening the way we thought or at the speed we thought, and we can make adjustments. And I think that's all this does. It actually helps us stay alert so that when the signals occur, we can react faster to solve disruptions and changes faster than we do now. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Uh, how did the overall cost of the newly constructed floating city concept compare to the comparable scale of major rehabilitation or renovations of existing cities? We are working through the economics of that. Um, and I think it's uh, our early view is that it's comparable. We had thought, well, maybe we can actually drive it down as a green field to be lower. Um, but I think it, it turns out to be somewhat comparable. Uh, so I think for coastal cities, I think an equal balance of things will happen. As coastal flooding worsens, I think some people will decide to move inland. We see early signals of that. Um, uh, when Indonesia announces that their capital is not going to be Jakarta anymore because they're not going to spend the money to uh, fight off the encroaching uh, waters, they're simply going to move inland. When Canada announces that if your house is in a certain coastal zone and you flood under some set of rules, you don't get a house insurance payout anymore, you just get relocation money. Those are early signals that some things are going to move inland. Likewise, I think there's going to be an equal amount of people and cities that will figure out what a thriving coastal city looks like. And over time, it will be less about seawalls and it will be more about being adaptive to the rising water and figuring out what does that balance look like? How can certain structures become both underwater, flooded, and out of water other times and still represent a perfectly viable way for that coastal city to operate? And so I think that will happen. And then I think there will be a third that will actually begin to move offshore. And we actually see early evidence of that outside the US in uh, driven by places like Holland, who've been dealing with flood waters forever, and a, a Asia Pacific nations who are dealing with that, and they actually can't they can't actually move inland. There's no place to move to. It's not viable to maintain the coastal environment. And if they want nation state sovereignty, they have to create an island nation in a different way. Uh, so I think we're actually going to see the economics balance out to be roughly equal for all three phenomena. And I think people will make living locations and urbanization choices based upon the logical availability of all three of those options. And whether that's 40 years from now or 80 years from now, I don't know, but I think it will happen. And the final question, are the future world briefings done only in the US or are they also international? They are also international. Last week, I uh, gave this presentation or run very similar to it at the University of Piraeus, Piraeus in Greece, uh, which heads the EU Center uh, for uh, Research in Maritime Infrastructure. Uh, and I've given this briefing in Rotterdam. I've given this briefing in Sydney. Um, we, we want, we will be very careful to make this as global a phenomena as possible, because I think it has application. Some areas of the world are moving faster than the US. 
other places were moving faster than them. And finally, uh, one thing that does worry me in our early stages, we're 20 months into a four year development now. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow, the prototype of the mega city will debut at the ASCE annual convention, which began this morning and it runs for three days. Uh, and so our, our full prototype of the mega city launches tomorrow. Um, but I would say, as we look back at the cities, the world, the city worlds that we envision, they looking back now, they still feel a little North American and European centric to me. And so with the rural city, when we get that one, we are going to make a deliberate shift and actually make sure we accommodate with our rural city phenomena that I would say is more applicable to the global South and potentially the Middle East, because uh, that's the one where we can do that. So on our next city, we will actually make some changes to make it uh, even more applicable to the developing world. Um, but other than that, we intend for this to be a, a globally used. Well, that is all the time we have for questions. So thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, for Thank your presentation you. on the future world vision. It was my pleasure to be with you. I uh, wish you a great showcase uh, and thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, at this time, we just want to address one question that Mike Russo wants to uh, comment on. Uh, that question was, how well does uh, mileage-based user fees work? How well does mileage-based user fee work if you're not using your car on some days? Mike. Uh, so that's a good question. We've been asked that several times. Um, it's not really about how frequently you're driving because we've got that question uh, because of, you know, just people working from home and not putting miles on the car that they typically do. What this really is about is us familiarizing people with the technology, um, familiarizing people with the difference between paying for your vehicle miles traveled as opposed to um, paying um, based on fuel consumption. So really the, the amount of miles driven isn't gonna take away from the experience. One of the things we are really trying to accomplish is to get people to understand the cost of transportation. Um, I don't think most people realize that they're paying on average $269 per year um, in New Jersey gas taxes um, with another uh, $98 per year in federal gas tax. Um, that annual cost uh, for driving our roads um, is really less than what I pay for me and my family on a monthly cable bill. And I don't think most people realize the cost of transportation. Uh, so really, this is about understanding the technology, um, getting people to, to recognize um, the differences. It's really an educational process. So the number of miles traveled um, isn't all that significant. And I would really encourage folks to enroll. Um, the more data we have, the better we can understand this and the better we can understand whether this is a viable option for the state of New Jersey. Um, I sent out an email yesterday um, to everybody registered for this program. And in that email, there's a fact sheet and there's links to the um, coalition's website so they can get additional information if interested. Uh, but I would really encourage everybody to participate uh, because we really need your input and would appreciate your input. Thanks, Ted. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, moving on. Our next presentation is the announcement of the 2020 NJDOT Research Showcase Awards. This year, the award winners will be revealed by Amanda Gendek, manager of the New Jersey Department of Transportation Bureau of Research. Hey, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Valeria and Jerry for your time and efforts to make our showcase successful. I feel very honored to be able to present these awards today in recognition of the hard work and innovative thinking of our students our researchers, and our NJDOT employees. The individuals I'm about to recognize uh, have logged countless hours in the classroom, the lab, behind computer screens, 
out in the maintenance yards and on the roads to develop innovative solutions to complex transportation problems, problems that affect each and every one of us as drivers in the Garden State. So first, I would like to present the Outstanding University Student in Transportation Award to Larura Maquez Soares. She is currently enrolled in the PhD program in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rutgers the State University of New Jersey. Ms. Soares is a graduate student researcher working on one of our current research projects titled Energy Harvesting on New Jersey Roadways. Harvesting energy from highway assets has several benefits. The use of renewable energy will decrease greenhouse gas emissions, diversify energy supply, and reduce dependence on imported fuels. The project objective is to identify potential technologies, methodologies, and materials for energy harvesting on NJDOT roadways and conduct a feasibility study of such technologies for application on NJDOT roadways. Ms. Soares has demonstrated her interest in transportation engineering since 2014 while pursuing an exchange program at Rutgers University funded by the Brazilian government. As an undergraduate exchange student, she did summer research on pervious pavement as a better solution than reflective pavements to mitigate the urban heat island effect. She has received several competitive awards that certainly prove her ability and potential to conduct influential research. Larura also received the School of Graduate Study Dean's Fellowship from Rutgers University and maintains a 4.0 GPA. So congratulations, Ms. Soares. I would like to present the New Jersey Department of Transportation Research Implementation Award. This award goes to Dr. Yusuf Mehta of Rowan University and his team for the project titled Environmental Impacts of Reclaimed Asphalt Pavements. Reclaimed asphalt pavement, otherwise known as RAP, is considered the most recyclable material in the, in the United States. This study has led to the development of legislation that allows recycled asphalt pavement to be used for quarry reclamation, except under specific conditions, on the surface of the ground without being mixed with new material and in other previously restricted applications. It was signed into law in January of 2018 and went into effect on October 1st, 2018. This is one project that has led to implementation in the field almost immediately after completion of the study. Dr. Mehta is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rowan. His co-principal investigators for the project are Eamon Ali, Rowan University, Baizan Yan, Columbia University, Fu Ming Yin, of Columbia University, and Anne McElroy of Stony Brook University. So congratulations, Dr. Mehta and your team. This one is the 2020 Research Showcase Best Award poster. And I would like to award that to Thales Koto Bergim for his poster presentation of the project titled Load Rating and Monitoring of the Sagging Fascia Girder of I-287 Bridge over 206 or, um, excuse me, over US 206 and 202. Thales is a graduate assistant and PhD candidate at Rutgers University and is part of the Infrastructure Monitoring Evaluation Group. His winning poster will be presented later in today's program. So please tune into that and join me in wishing Thales a very deserved congratulations on a job well done. Now on to our final award of this year's showcase and was mentioned as our commissioners and my favorite award of the year. Uh, this is our 2020 Build a Better Mousetrap Award. And the recipient of this award is the anti-jackknife device developed by Scott Ainsley and Mark Crago of the NJDOT Operations Unit and Freehold Garage. Scott and Mark developed the device after having experienced issues with new employees training for their commercial driver's licenses. They had four incidents which resulted in vehicles and trailers getting damaged during CDL training from jackknifing the trailer while participating, I'm sorry, while practicing maneuvers for this, their CDL test. This prompted Scott and Mark to develop an early warning device to prevent jackknives and damage to trucks and trailers during new employee CDL training. 
incidents were costing over $2,000 each time to repair. The anti-jackknife device was inexpensive to build at about $165. Since implementing the anti-jackknife device, they have not had any incidents. Up next are two short video clips of this innovative device in action. So congratulations to Scott and Mark for your innovative invention. Congratulations to the deserving group of award recipients. Next on our agenda is part one of our virtual poster session. Our first poster presentation is titled, Optimized Speed Profiles for Sustainable Train Operation with Regenerative Braking, and is presented by Leon Allen from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Hello everyone, my name is Leon Allen, and on behalf of myself and co-author Stephen Chen, I thank you for your interest in our research entitled Optimized Speed Profiles for Sustainable Train Operation with Regenerative Braking. We all know the effect fossil fuels have on the environment, and since in the U.S. 62% of electricity is derived from fossils, then we know that electrical consumption is an indirect contributor to climate change. Electric trains are extremely efficient, but due to the scale of operations on railroads, large energy budgets are necessary. This research is concerned with reducing those budgets, therefore benefiting the operator and the environment by including coasting and regenerative braking into the motion regimes, and it also allows the kinetic energy of the train to be stored in a wayside energy storage system for subsequent reuse. We started off with Newton's second law of motion, which states that the sum of all forces acting on a body in motion is equal to its mass times its acceleration. Then the energy equations were developed using train specifications and alignment parameters. From those, the objective function was optimized using genetic algorithms. We conducted several sensitivities and found it beneficial to use higher speeds, longer trains, and more coasting. Also included were simulations during peak and off-peak periods, and also with the train in various degrees of lateness and earliness, of which we found peak hour to be the most energy efficient. We examined three scenarios. The baseline where no energy savings were employed. Scenario two, coasting was the only strategy. And scenario three, coasting and regenerative braking were applied together. The results obtained re revealed that the baseline consumed the most energy, which was expected, but had the shortest travel time. Scenario two delivered great savings over the baseline but the consumption was not optimal since only one strategy was included. Scenario three delivered optimal energy consumption that was superior to all the other scenarios. Also, coasting slow, slows the movement of the train. Therefore, scenario two had the longest duration in terms of travel time because it maximized the coasting regime. Scenario three had the second shortest travel time because it included a braking regime which was started at a relatively high speed to capture regenerative braking energy. The peak hour train consumes more energy because it carries more passenger and therefore 
It was heavier, but was more efficient in terms of BTU per passenger mile consumed. For the late and early trains, as long as the time allotted is greater than the optimal travel time, the simulator generates the optimal profile, which is scenario three. As the time allotted gets progressively shorter, the speed profile tends more to the baseline case of scenario one. In conclusion, the purpose of this study was to optimize the energy consumed by electric rail vehicles through coasting and regenerative braking subject to equipment and alignment constraints. It was found that separately the strategies delivered energy savings, but a synergistic application of coasting and regenerative braking delivered 14.3% savings at off-peak and 24.5% at peak periods over the case where only coasting was applied. When maximum allowable speed increase, energy consumed decreased, and when coasting is terminated at higher speeds, the amount of regenerative braking energy increased. Although the peak period initially consumed more energy because of the increased passenger weight, it was more energy efficient, consuming less BTU per passenger mile. Thanks for listening, and may you have a pleasant and safe rest of the day. Okay, thank you, Leon. Our second poster presentation is titled Load Rating and Monitoring of the Sagging Fascia Girder of I-287 Bridge over US-202-206. This is our best poster award winner of 2020. The project is being presented by Thales Koto Bragim of Rutgers University. This research is about the load rating, analysis, and monitoring of the sagging fascia girder of I-287 bridge over routes US-202-206. This bridge is a steel girder bridge that was built in 1966 and reconstructed in 1996 when the bridge was widened. Recently, it was observed an excessive permanent deflection in the east fascia girder. In order to investigate that, load rating analysis based on the MBE procedures was developed. A deficient rating factor in the severance limit state 2 was observed in the inventory level. Also, a detailed finite element model was developed and the actual dead loads and the live loads from a nearby wing site were applied in the model. The team concluded that it was important to install wind sensors right in the entrance of the bridge in order to extract the real truck traffic population. Also, it was important to install structure health monitoring sensors in order to extract, to extract the structure bridge response. Thus, the team installed the wind sensors and the structure health monitoring sensors. With a specific non truck, a diagnostic load test was performed in the bridge, and with the results, the finite element model was calibrated. Also, one year of data from the WIM system was collected. It was observed that 8.5% of the trucks had GVW over 80 keeps, meaning that 8.5% were overweight trucks. Also, 13% of the trucks violated the federal Formula B. With the truck population, the maximum moments and the maximum shears were calculated for a return period of one year, five year, and 75 years. Then, these results were normalized by the HL93 live load model in order to calculate the site-specific bias ratios. For all cases, the site-specific bias ratios were larger than the national average for the bias ratios. Finally, the load rating analysis was performed, but this time using a site-specific load factor. It was observed at efficient rating factors for the flexure and the service limit state 2 again. It is noted that in 1996, two girders were added in the bridge and also the east overhang was increased from 2.5 feet to 5 feet 
Also, the deck thickness increased from 8 inches to 9 inches. It is concluded that the potential causes for the sagging of the girder are the heavy dead load, also the overweight trucks that crosses the bridge. As recommendations in order to overcome this situation, New Jersey DOT could add cover plates in the bottom flange of the fascia girder or add a new girder or add a supplemental support in the bridge. Our third and final poster presentation for today is titled Process-Based Modeling for Inlet Management, presented by John K. Miller of Stevens Institute of Technology. Hi, I'm John Miller. I am a research associate professor in coastal engineering at Stevens in Hoboken. And I'm going to present the paper today uh, that my graduate students, uh, Laura Lemke and Matthew Jansen and myself, uh, put together based off of some NJDOT funded research looking at uh, sediment management alternatives for two coastal inlets. Uh, the two inlets in particular that we looked at were Fortescue Inlet on the Delaware Bay Shore and Kingsburg Inlet on the Raritan Bay Shore. Uh, the poster is focusing on the results from Raritan Bay and I think illustrate some of the usefulness of uh, numerical modeling, particularly coastal numerical modeling um, in coastal management uh, decisions. Uh, the first panel on the left uh, on the poster describes the location in the problem. Uh, the location again is Keensburg Inlet. Uh, Keensburg Inlet is an inlet on the Raritan Bay Shore, has a jetty on the eastern side of the inlet and is also the location of the Keensburg Tidegate. Uh, the tide gate presents some challenges related to the modeling, but it was found that the get gate itself does not substantially uh, influence the results um, that we found. The issue at Keensburg, as at Fortescue, is that the inlet is shoaling, or the, the channel uh, just outside of the inlet um, is filling up with sediment. Uh, the two images on the bottom uh, on the left-hand panel illustrate that the areas in red are areas of shoaling or filling in of sediment. Um, within the channel, as you can see. Um, and what's interesting is that that filling in occurs on both the western and eastern sides of the channel, and that's a result of the bidirectional wave climate. Uh, the two wind wave roses that you see, or wind roses that you see, uh, illustrate the variability. Um, one represents summer conditions and the other represents winter uh, conditions. So what we did is we used a numerical model called Delft 3D to uh, simulate the uh, sediment transport and morphodynamics um, in the vicinity of the inlet. Um, in order to do this, we actually conducted a, a month-long field experiment where we uh, collected wave and water level data, um, as well as current data, sediment transport data um, to calibrate and validate the numerical model. We specifically used Delft 3D in a, in a in a mode called flexible mesh, which allows us to create a large scale grid, which you see in the upper picture in the center panel um, of the entire Raritan Bay, and then focus in and create a higher resolution grid in the vicinity of the inlet itself, which is what you can see um, in the right hand side of that uh, upper picture in, in the center panel. Once we had a calibrated and validated numerical model, what we did is we uh, evaluated several alternatives. The alternatives are illustrated in the uh, lower picture in the center panel. These consisted of a base configuration, aka a do-nothing scenario, um, as well as um, modified dredging templates, um, which are the offshore def deposition basin, um, adding a structure, uh, adding a western jetty to the inlet, and modifying the existing structures. Um, after running our simulations, what we found was that the only solution which actually addressed the fact that sediment was coming from both directions was the deposition basin, or what we've broadly termed as adaptive, uh, adaptive dredging techniques. Um, essentially, the deposition basins allow the sediment to fall out into artificially deepened areas outside of the uh, throat of the channel. Uh, allows the channel to maintain, it, stay open uh, while these uh, deposition basins fill up. Um, once the deposition basins fill up, you have to go back and dredge them out. However, um, you save the cost of mobilization. So we're estimating based on our modeling results that the dredging frequency can be reduced from every year to something like every two or three years. And therefore, uh, that results in a substantial cost savings related to the mobilization costs. Um, I think the overall uh, conclusions based on both modeling efforts was that the, the process-based numerical modeling uh, of these processes is capable of 
identifying potentially more appropriate uh, inlet management uh, uh, conditions, um, resulting in a substantial cost savings over what is sometimes thought of as the default solution, which is just to either reinforce or build new structures um, adjacent to the inlet. I'd like to thank Leon, Thales, and John for their posters. Outstanding job. This concludes today's program. Please join us again tomorrow at 9 a.m. as we kick off the second day of the virtual research showcase with presentations representing mobility, safety, and resilience, and even more. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for being here today.